afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, Hire the Best of the Class of 2016. My name is Jessica Schaefer, and as Tom alluded to, I am not a 2016 grad. Um, I'm joined by Tom Gimbel today, who's moderating along the webinar along with me. For those of you who don't know Tom, he is the founder and CEO of LaSalle Network and has become a sought-after careers and company culture expert. At LaSalle Network, each year we place thousands of recent college graduates and seasoned professionals alike in roles within accounting and finance, administrative, customer service, marketing, human resources, technology, healthcare revenue cycle, and supply chain. We've been really fortunate to be recognized both for our growth and our culture. We've been named by Inc. Magazine as one of the fastest growing private companies in America for the past nine years in a row and by Glassdoor as one of the best places to work in the country this year. All right, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping things. We'd love for you to join the conversation. You can do that by submitting questions through the GoToWebinar panel or by tweeting to us using the hashtag class of 2016. All right, all of the data that we will present during this webinar is from our own original research. In April of 2016, we surveyed more than 13,000 recent college graduates, and we're excited to walk through the findings with you today. From this data and Tom's analysis and insight, we hope you're able to walk away knowing when to start recruiting recent college graduates, if recent college grads will accept temporary work, if they're passionate about a specific industry, what they're looking for in their first role out of college, and what their salary expectations are. With that, I'll turn it over to Tom to talk through our survey demographics. So in the 13,000 people that we surveyed, we got a great response. And 98% of all respondents have a bachelor's degree, with the other 2% uh, having an associate's degree. So I think this is important to say we're, we're, we targeted a certain demographic of people who graduated from college and the overwhelming majority having bachelor's degrees. Of that, 73% of the, the graduates were employed, 27% were unemployed. Um, of the majors, we grouped them into six categories, business degrees, social sciences, marketing and communication, STEM, liberal arts, and natural sciences. Natural sciences being the least, tend to be more biology, chemistry, things along those lines. So I'm going to hand it back to Jess as we're going to do a quick poll and then guide a little bit of the direction moving forward. All right, great. So now that we know a little bit about who we surveyed, let's find out a little bit about you guys. Do you plan to hire recent graduates this year, or have you already? Please take a few minutes to submit your response, and we'll talk through them in just a minute. If you can all close your eyes and hear the Jeopardy music going as we're, we're waiting for the poll results. I think that'll add an effect. <laughs> all right, we're going to close that out. Unsurprisingly, it looks like you all are in the right place. 90% of our webinar respondents said that they are looking to hire recent college graduates this year. Um, so you're in the right place. Now let's dig into our survey. One of the first questions we asked recent college graduates was, when did you begin applying for jobs? What we found was not surprising. Most recent college graduates start looking for positions early, with 57% looking three months to one year before they graduate. Tom, is that typical? Is that what we normally see? Yeah, what we've seen is, is great, really an increase of career services that are happening at universities across the country. And whether it be uh, junior colleges or four-year colleges, um, it's really been an area that, that, that they have, academic institutions, have really bulked up. And with career services, it's building alliances with corporations. Now, what it used to be 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago is people felt it was only huge corporations that participated with on-site job fairs and career services. And that's changed quite a bit. Um, over the past five or ten years, both through virtual job fairs and career fairs, as well as more companies being willing to invest and knowing with the baby boomers phasing out of the workforce and needing an influx of college graduates to replace them, they put more onus there. So it really is a common trend and quite frankly I think over the next two to five years we're going to see that number increase from 57 percent probably up to 65 or 70 percent and really make a dent. And I think the other thing is we're talking about 
uh, moving into to recruiting early in career fairs and career centers and internship programs is to realize that as potential employers, it's so important for both hiring managers and human resources to stay away from the negative rhetoric about millennials and to embrace the college graduates as something that we need. And corporations need those people to fill jobs. They need them for their creative and, and um, communication skills. And corporations and, and managers also need them from a standpoint of technology in the, the 21st century of being able to, to step up to the plate in, in areas that companies may be lacking and not just in social media. And so I think that uh, I don't think I know that we've got to get a more positive spin from all corporations, not just Silicon Valley and not just Boston and not just the 1871 hub in Chicago, but all corporations have to believe that millennials are smart, hardworking, aggressive, and motivated, and evolve our communication style in order to embrace them and make them, make them feel wanted. So we get into career fairs, and I think this is really uh, an important aspect of, of how you go about it. Too often what companies do is they delegate it to a very low-level staffer, and maybe as a, as a perk or a reward, they throw it to some senior person in a line group, whether it be a staff accountant for accounting or a, a marketing coordinator or a junior salesperson, and they say, oh, you graduated from Indiana or Illinois or, or Notre Dame or Virginia or wherever, go back there for a job fair and, and spread the gospel of our company instead of really creating an action plan. And it's setting up a booth. It's getting an apron. It's making sure that it, your, your uh, giveaways look professional. And then it's coaching these people on what they have to do. And I don't know how many people on the call or in general have been to trade shows, but having worked my way up through uh, my career, I've always spent time at trade shows, either in attendance and or working a booth. And I think we all know the types of people who really work a, a career fair or a trade show, which I consider to be uh, the same thing, at a really aggressive way to go out and get people excited. Um, but if you have alumni who went to a certain college, you do want to capitalize on, capitalize on that because it does create a connection between the the, the student body and your organization, but you can't say just because somebody went to the University of Michigan they know how to work the career fair. It is a different mentality and in addition, following up afterwards, who's sending notes or emails to these folks, what's the next step following on that? It's like a good salesperson. You send them to an event and they don't follow up on the business cards they get, they don't create um, a process afterwards, it really becomes a waste of time. So what do you do with career centers? Right? Number one, you want to make sure that you're going to get your booth in a good alignment. And some of this stuff you may say, Tom, you're not telling me anything new. I'm telling you that if everybody did these things, um, it would be a, much harder to get the good booth space. A lot of companies, when I talk to career services people, whether it's at Notre Dame, we're doing a lot of stuff at U of I in Northern, uh, Iowa and Michigan State, you'd be surprised how many companies don't build relationships with the actual people. So you're paying a few hundred dollars, up to a thousand dollars usually, um, for a booth at a, at a career services fair. You want to offer resume advice. So you've got people coming through. They may or may not be right for your company today, but five years from now they may want to come work for your company. Build relationships where they leave your, your booth with a positive impression of your organization and talk about resume advice. Offer with career services to host mock interview sessions. They are dying for professional people to come in and run real life scenario based job interviewing sessions for their people because it's not a class that's usually taught in college campuses. In fact, the majority of them don't. But career services wants to, but they lack the, the depth of people to be able to, to um, work and participate in that environment. And then career coaching. You can get involved with college's alumni networks in addition to their graduating seniors. So there's a lot that goes into that. In addition, you'd be surprised how many juniors participate in career fairs and they want to know, which we'll get into in a little bit, about internship uh, opportunities and how that fits in. So when you get into intern ready positions, it, and it's easier said than done. If you're located in Chicago and you bring interns in from Northwestern to Paul, University of Chicago, UIC Loyola, it's easier because they can work throughout the school year. But it can be from any college where, where students come in, they intern over a summer, maybe they want to come back over, over holiday break and things like that, and you build an intern ready position that it's turnkey. 
they come in and then they can progress into your organization into a staff level spot. Right? But you've got to create goals and development track for interns. Even if they're filing and doing data entry and, and doing organizational type stuff for one departments, you can still have goals, check-ins, and development tracks for them. You'd be surprised for a 20, 21, 22-year-old college student to get 15 minutes every other week with a manager, a director, a vice president to say, you're doing A, B, and C right, you could improve on D, E, and F. That's life-changing for people, and that makes an impact in people's life. And then create something, whether it's through your human resources department, your marketing department, or the hiring manager that's going to be bringing these youngsters in after they graduate, that there's some sort of communication checkpoint that's part of your process for working with recent college grads. So I'll hand it back to Jessica because we have another survey question. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's probably one of the hardest parts is staying in touch with college graduates after they intern. Um, so that's a great point, Tom. The next survey question that we asked um, is, what type of work would unemployed graduates be willing to take? So if you remember at the beginning of the survey, Tom referenced that 27% of our survey respondents were unemployed. So we surveyed this group, and what we found was that graduates are willing to take permanent positions. So 98% of recent college graduates wanted a permanent position, not surprising whatsoever. What was surprising, though, is that 60% of these unemployed recent college graduates were willing to accept temporary and temporary to permanent positions. Tom, has it always been this way, or is this a new trend? No, I think it's always been. I, I don't think. I know it's always been this way. So the other question before we get into these numbers is, it's 98%. So people will say, well, what does the other 2% want? It means they'll do temp to perm. They'll do flexible schedules. And, and that's an interesting thing because they want to try things out before they make a commitment to a career. They want to see what else they're feeling. So obviously, we're being a, a, a recruiting and staffing firm that provides that labor, we want to always know what the market's indicating, not just from our clients but for our candidates. And we see a lot of people, if they don't have a job coming up to mid-May, that they're very open to temporary and temp to perm positions. And the reason is they want to explore situations, number one. Number two, they're going in and interviewing with recruiting and staffing firms, and they're seeing and hearing and learning about this viable source of, of employment. And then number three, they're success stories of people that started out in temporary roles um, I'm, not, I'm not picking political sides, and I tell you, it was a big thing when Carly Fiorina was running for president, and she started out as an administrative assistant to become CEO of a Fortune 500 company at Hewlett Packard. And I think there's stories on a much more micro level of employees who started out, heck, in my own company, I have uh, two of my executive lead uh, team members started out as temporary employees. So I think there's a lot of stories that get light shed on them that says to recent college graduates, you make your own opportunity. And if you're, if you're fortunate enough or you are career focused enough in February to know what you want to do that you get an offer, God bless you. That's a terrific situation to be in. If you don't know what you want, right, we always call certain jobs of some of our clients a liberal arts student's dream because they don't necessarily know with an English major or, or a a journalism or a history or, or even an econ or a sociology or anthropology degree, what they want to do and how can they apply the soft skills that they learned to a career where they can make a living and there's a lot of opportunities. Plus, as this slide illustrates, graduates are more flexible than you think. So you've got people who are 22 years old and graduating right now and you know they graduated in 19 or they were born in 1994 1992 so you, you've got this demographic that they don't know a life before the internet. They don't know a life as an adult before an Uber, before you could use your phone to get a, a cab ride, uh, Instacart for getting groceries delivered whenever, Amazon Prime that they can have anything come to their, their apartment, house, or dorm whenever they want it, TaskRabbit to, to get things done for them. So I think you have these different vehicles. And so they look at work differently and, and they believe what they read uh, via social media. And and that is the gig economy. That is, I can have a job for six months doing temporary work and then figure it out. And quite frankly, I can't tell you how many companies come to me and say, give me somebody who's just got six or eight months of work experience doing something. So we don't have to be the first one to teach them 
where the coffee machine is, how to take a break, how to ask for help, how to understand being at work a few minutes early and staying at work late if you have a project. Somebody who can appreciate the environment which we've created. So it leads us, uh, when we look at that type of situation, to ask another survey question that I think you'll find the data very interesting. Yeah, so we wanted to see if there was a sexy industry right now that's drawing recent college graduates. I think hopefully the good news for all of us is that respondents selected, the second most selected answer was any industry that will hire me. So while marketing and advertising took the cake with 47% of respondents, respondents could select more than one answer, and the second selected answer was any industry that will hire me. Tom, what do you think about that? Well, the, the interesting thing is marketing and advertising out of college tend to be one of the lowest paying industries. And so what you tend to find out with recent college graduates is we come from this, this perception of millennials and 20-somethings that they're looking for money. They're all out. There's two, there's two sides to that. Let me, let me back up. One is they're so uh, Teach for America driven. They want to do volunteer work. They're cause driven. And the other one is they have high expectations that they should be paid more just because they're more technologically savvy than any other generation. And what this says more than anything else is that there's, there's two types. There's one that wants a sexy industry, marketing and advertising, that's a low-paying industry, which doesn't fit in any bucket, or they want an opportunity. And I will tell you that overwhelmingly, and this has been since I've been in the recruiting and staffing industry for 20 years, is that people want an opportunity to work for a company that will believe in them. And it's very different in, now, the majority of the people on, on uh, this webinar today are Midwest, Illinois-based companies. And I will tell you that it is a different environment in the Midwest than it is on either coast and that you have a little bit more traditional grounded organization and it stems from think about where people in the midwest where their parents worked they worked at walgreens and they worked at northern trust bank and they worked at um i mean think of uh, they worked at caterpillar or john deere you go up north they worked at target in minneapolis or Coles in milwaukee right john deere in the quad cities so you have these traditional um, very conservative Midwestern values and these kids have grown up and gone to college and they want opportunity because they believe and they've been taught that give me an opportunity and I will outwork anyone and isn't that really what we want out of people people that want an opportunity to work so when we move into the company not having to be sexy is a pharmacy isn't a sexy sale Right? A bank may not, a traditional bank, not an investment bank, isn't a sexy sale. And when you look at companies like Google, and it, I mean, what happened this week with LinkedIn is a great example. Yesterday, I was talking to some technology people the other day, and, and we were talking about what hot companies are and how LinkedIn is really the leader due to the combination of social media plus database management plus B2B and simultaneously B2C without the, the dollar exchange on the consumer side. And I talked, I called up a couple of those folks yesterday after the Microsoft acquisition of LinkedIn and they said, wow, LinkedIn sold out to the man. Right? LinkedIn is now part of Microsoft and will become part of the Microsoft Office. Microsoft Windows, the traditional rollout, charge you more, same product, lesser services, right? So what's hot and sexy yesterday isn't always what's hot and sexy tomorrow. So the question is, for individuals who are looking to come into work, you're 22, 23, 24 years old, what's sexy? Career path. If you can show if you can show that people have been hired in their first year, two years, three years out of college and they have had career progression, now you're on to something. If you can show that the manager is somebody who grew up in the organization, you're on to something. If you're showing that your company traditionally is profitable and has revenue growth, you're on to something. That is what people want to buy. You're not competing. Too often in, in non-tech companies and even in tech companies, they think they're competing against Google and Facebook. You, you can't. It's like the five-person CPA from thinking they're competing against EY or Deloitte and Touche. They're not. They're creating, they have different offerings, different companies, different learning tracks, different cultures. You have to embrace what you are and you have to know what your culture is. And you use your marketing department combined with your human resources department to figure out a way, both in print and online and electronically, to create a culture display. 
right? To show what your culture is and what the opportunity is for growth. So what you're doing is you're highlighting culture on your website and through social media. So a local Chicago company, uh, Assurance, they've been consistently ranked and, and viewed as, as one of the great places to work in, in the Chicagoland and Illinois area. They're one of the leaders in the insurance brokerage field for hiring millennial talent and training and developing them. And they're not a, it's not a cakewalk. It's a, it's a hard-driven, growth-oriented company where you can learn and grow, and it talks about it right on, right on the front page or right on the, their uh, what the company is and what it is to join the A you know, they call it the A team. They say, this is what we are. We are the A team. They take pride in who they are and what they're about. And it, it goes a long way. This is my own company's page, LaSalle Network, and we say, we're growing. Come grow with us. And we are um, we call ourselves LaSalians, the same way Google call, refers to themselves as Googlers. Right, and and it's an important thing to take pride in your company, and we we do a lot of um, celebrations when we win big deals, and we have great quarters, when we hire new people, when we celebrate people's work anniversaries here, and we want people to know about that. This is a place where we work hard, and then we acknowledge that with success and celebration. And when you when you emphasize that, that's the culture. Too often people think it's having a bar in the office or it's bringing your dog to work. Those are perks. Those aren't culture things. Because at the end of the day, people will take more money and leave their dog at home with a dog sitter than take less money to stay and have their dog at work. But to feel appreciated, to feel that they're being developed, to feel that they're, they're being professionally and personally challenged and growing, that is priceless, and people will not walk away for a few thousand dollars more to think that they're not going to be given the same opportunities to develop and grow and become accountable. So how do you sell your culture? And I think it's really important um, to talk about this from the job description. Right? Everybody does them. A lot of them are old and boring. Some of them are new and fresh. But look at the writing that's in blue. Right? We emphasize, we've been named a Glassdoor's best place to work. Glassdoor is the leading site for people to go to find out the behind the scenes um, views on a company. And I know a lot of you are sitting there going, oh, Glassdoor, the anonymity kills me. You get negative people who go up there the day after they're fired and they post negative things. Yes, they do. And you got to hope that the job seekers are going to sift out and look for the positives, which you should be having your staff write, as well as the negative, and know that there's a happy medium. And isn't that what everything is about? Compromise, happy medium, finding out what's right about things for them. Right? Too often we have people say, oh, I want to work there. My friend says it's great. Well, i got to tell you, I have friends that like uh, Middle Eastern food. Uh, it kind of gives me a bellyache. Right? What's right for my friend doesn't make it right for me. You've got to go and explore situations on your own and create an environment that you believe as human resources leaders, as hiring managers, as the C-suite, that is a healthy environment and then attract people that want that environment. Don't try to put a round peg in a, in a, in a square hole. And look, at we, we put in here, we're a nine-time Inc. 5000 fastest growing company. We're growing fast. This is not going to be a cakewalk. We work hard and we laugh a lot. There's a lot of people that don't want that. There's a lot of people that want to come in, put their head down, close their door, get their work done, leave. And i got to tell you, there's a place for those people. And those are great people for a different culture and a different environment. And then you have to sell the opportunity. You've got to make sure, and this is the biggest challenge in corporations, the hiring managers don't necessarily see the opportunity that human resources people do. And you've got executives that are thinking the company's going one way, and the hiring managers are trying to get their work done for today. And it's getting everybody on the same page for where this company can go. And I can't tell you how many times, how many times, that hiring managers have laid out a career path for a, a new division or a new opportunity that may be coming down the pipe in 12 or 18 months, and human resources has no idea what they're talking about. So the communication behind the scenes at a corporation is so important to be able to sell this. And then highlighting a company's success on a website and in the press. If your company's in the press, if they're being featured in the Tribune, the Sun-Times, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, the, the Boston Globe, the New York Times, what have you, 
Inc. Magazine. You've got to put that on your website. You've got to make that accessible and easy for people to see because that's what people take pride in. They take pride in the social media tweets and reposts of what's been, been published and making sure that that's up to speed. And I think, Tom, you talk about this a lot, empowering your employees to share that type of news, too. It just doesn't need to come from a corporate brand. It can come from brand advocates that are your staff. Oh, you want, you want your employees to take pride. You want your employees to share what's going on at the company. Um, it's a differentiator. And it, it's, it's funny. So many people will go on vacation and they'll post on Instagram and Facebook everything they're doing personally. And they want to share. They want their friends to see pictures. But yet the thing we spend the most time doing, working, we don't advertise that nearly enough. And if you're at a company that's being named a best place to work or at a company that just closed a huge deal, to post that on social media and to share that gets your friends and family excited about career. You can change in a certain demographic the perception of work in your company in the marketplace. And that, to me, i got to tell you, it makes it really, really exciting. Definitely. So before we get into the next survey question that we asked, we actually wanted to ask all of the webinar attendees what they thought. So our next poll is, what do you think recent graduates care about most in a role? Is it challenging work, the ability to work from home, opportunities for growth like Tom's been speaking to, autonomy, or work-life balance? So take a few minutes, take a few seconds, excuse me, select your answer. Tom, if you had to guess, what would you say? I would tell you from the the webinar folks yeah, or from, from the webinar folks. I would say that webinar folks are going to say work life balance. All right, a couple more seconds. Let's prove them wrong. Prove them right. All right, overwhelmingly, fifty four percent of survey respondents said they wanted opportunities for growth. Thirty four percent agreed with you, Tom, and said work life balance and 12% said challenging work. No one said autonomy and no one said the ability to work from home. What do you think about that? Well, I'm not surprised, by, obviously I'm not surprised by the work-life balance, but that was the webinar folks. And I, and I think that as, as people who are in corporate America that are hiring millennials, I think there's this preconceived notion that we're afraid we're going to lose candidates because they need this predetermined view on work-life balance and we're not laying things out open and honestly and candidly for what we really need in our corporation. There aren't a lot of super high growth companies that are game changers that um, where the people that are really rising fast and growing aren't working a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that there aren't jobs that aren't that way. You can always find jobs that, that exist that way. However, companies that do great things require great attention. And you've got to be tuned in. I'm not saying that you can't have outside interest. I like to think that our company is pretty hard charging. I've got people that are taking three-day weekends quite often. It doesn't mean that Monday through Thursday they're not cranking it out a little bit later in order to, to compensate for that. I've got people that are doing a PTO day off in order to do a Habitat for Humanity that we sponsor. It doesn't mean that they're not cranking it out the other day. So life is a give and take, and it's about the environment that your company wants to have about what the accomplishments are that your C-suite wants to take the company there and then finding people that can do that and certain jobs and certain companies may say we can grow at 8 to 12 percent and we can do that at having a certain percentage of our workforce have a very traditional job schedule and that's great and other companies may say we want to go 20, 25, 30 percent, we want to be thought leaders, we want to be giving huge career opportunity and advancement for people, and we want to have a management training program and yada, 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 and you got to go in, in a different way. So I think you know, the, the fact that um, opportunity for growth and accountability and challenging work, I mean, that's what people want. That is what people want. And I, I think this is, this is the people who go to the gym and get a personal trainer. This is the people that after working out, they are, are sweating and dripping and feel hurt and crushed, and they come back tomorrow or two days later, and they do it again. They want to be challenged. They want expectations. They want growth. And, and they feel the satisfaction. And, and the difference is, is, you know, the parallels end at some point. Um, but with work, 
to know that through your brain and your thought process, you added value to others. And so when I say the analogy ends at a certain point, when you go to the gym and you get beaten on, you're doing it for yourself. And that's a very worthwhile thing. When you are held accountable and challenged and you have an opportunity to grow and what you do affects your coworkers and your bosses and if you get into management, subordinates and customers and vendors and all these people know that you kicked some serious butt and you delivered, that sense, that's the best endorphin you can ever have. And that is where you get people that keep going and driving and pushing because you get addicted to that feeling of having people tell you, you did really great. We couldn't have done this without you. All these people get to keep their jobs because you delivered on this message. When you have that type of culture and that type of mentality, people want to grow. And that's acknowledgement. That's acknowledgement. And when people are really successful, and here's the hidden secret that no one talks about. When people are really successful at work, they actually begin to feel like they have more work-life balance because they're happier at work. And when you're happier at work, you do better, and then you have flexibility when you're better to be able to do the things you need to do outside of the office. But it comes with success and recognition. So then it becomes career paths and development. And I think this is really important because so many companies today, when they talk about career paths and development, it gets caught off guard and people start leaning towards perks. You have summer hours, right? You have, uh, and i got to tell you, I know more people that are depressed in the winter than the summer. We should probably send people home at noon in the wintertime and, and get their, get their sour push faces out of here and keep them here in the summer when they're happy. But that's a whole nother, a whole nother conversation for a different webinar. But in, in all seriousness, when we look at career paths and development, we've got to have that on our website. We've got to have it on social media and talk about the people who get promoted. Careers pages, job descriptions, interviews. And there's a couple companies that do that really, really well. And so we pulled one off of Johnson & Johnson, and there's actually real-time people, and they say, what's it like to work here? Career mobility is unique here at J&J, &J, right? And it shows where the promotion track was, what line of the business they were in. It has supporting career growth, functionality, students, business, what country, discover our business, right? It talks about the opportunity at this company. And I think that's a really interesting facet from a Fortune 500 company to be focused on where you can go. Now, the key is communication because you've got to have people come in and know that for the first 12, 18, 24, 36 months, they've got to grind it out in their role in order to get the opportunity. But that comes from management and human resources communication to teach people. And you've got to have a plan. You've got to have it written down. Right? At six months, we're going to talk to our high potential new grads, and we're going to talk to them about where we're going. Right? In the job process, at career services, we're going to talk to people about the, the opportunity. Because you don't want to be known as a bait-and-switch mentality where you tell people they can accomplish anything, but only 1% ever get the opportunity to do it. You look at PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC, and you go onto their website, your career and strategy. Meet our people, learning and development, mentoring and assessment process. Um, we put in a mentorship program two years ago. It's been one of the most resounding, successful programs and led to more employee retention than I ever could have dreamed. Right? And it's not something that I thought was a big seller here, but people have gravitated towards it. And it's really helped us get a good gauge on new people and how to alter their onboarding and development as time has gone on. But if you look at this, it lines up when you start out as an associate. You go to senior associate, manager, director, partner. Things that everybody knows if they go to work at a, at a public accounting firm or a consulting firm. But when you see it in print or on, on the screen in social media, on a website, it becomes real. You can almost touch it, and that takes it to a whole different level. Right? I mean, going back to the job positions, right? this position is open because the person previously in this role was promoted. That sends a message. You're next. You take this job. You're next. Direct access to executives. Right? And you've got to tell people there's good and bad to that because I'll tell you what, once you have access to executives, they know who you are and they ask you to take on a project, you better deliver. 
But if you want that opportunity, if you want to be in the, in the spotlight, and you put that in your job description, that attracts a certain type of A player. And you can own projects from beginning to end. That's powerful. It's powerful. During the interview, whether you're a Fortune 500 company, whether you're a technology company, whether you just took venture and private equity money and you're in the front page of cranes or, or um, different blogs or web posts about TechCrunch or whatever it might be, you need to sell yourself to these companies. You need to talk about your training and development to them, what they're going to experience, what they're going to feel, and quite frankly, or the lack of training and development. You, you can reverse it. You can say you're training and development. We don't have a formalized problem because our top people learn through baptism by fire. And you're going to be working side by side, those A players. Right? So either way, you can figure out a plan, but you have to have a plan, and you have to get management involved for the interview process of how they're going to sell these opportunities. Share, share examples of employees who have been promoted. You've got to have it. It doesn't take that much. Right? You get a nice glossy sheet of paper. You have your marketing department put a profile of somebody, and you check off what their career path has been, and you give it to people in an interview. And they look and they say, not only is there opportunity for me, they take pride in the people who are there. And then the access to leadership and autonomy. Great. Thanks, Tom. The last question that we asked survey respondents was about their salary expectations. How much money were they expecting to make, and did they end up making it if they were employed? So what we found was that, unsurprisingly, recent college graduates are expecting to make more money than they actually end up earning. 42% make less than they expected, and 33% make the same as they expected. Tom, does that seem on par? Is that what we're seeing? No, I, I, I'm actually surprised that a bigger percentage isn't making less than what they expected. I, the majority of people I meet, whether they're 22 or 52, think they should be making more than what they are. There's just a human nature that even if I'm being paid fairly and I, I'm happy with where I'm at, I think I should be making a little bit more. There's always that mentality. So what we've got is a little bit of a reality check. We've seen with whether it's Macy's reporting bad earnings and whether they're going to make it, whether it was LinkedIn before the Microsoft purchase, their stock dropping by such a big amount. We're seeing that, that people are a little bit nervous about the economy right now. We've got the presidential election coming up this year with two candidates that nobody's quite in love with. And we're looking at this and people are saying, you know what, I'm going to take a job if it's the right opportunity for me. And I'm less worried about how much it's going to be paying. Yeah. And, and I've seen that, you know, I'm, I'm old enough that I, was, I came out of college after the recession of 91, 92. I was here during the dot-com bubble bursting in 2000 and 2001 and the recovery after and, and coming out of the, the 2008 crash and, and what we did in 2009. So I, I've seen this happen a lot and, and people want to work. Most importantly, they want jobs. They want to grow. So I think, Jess, we have some slides here that you wanted to talk about. Yep, we're going to break it down by, bis by major um, and look at the salary expectations. So 66% of respondents with a business major, which can include finance, accounting, business, and management majors, expected to earn between $41,000 and $70,000. Social sciences, which can include anthropology, sociology, and psychology, 49% of these majors expected to make between $31,000 and $40,000 a year. Jess, I was a sociology major, and 22 years ago, I came out, my first job paid $17,400. Different time, probably. Yeah, no, no, totally. Well, not probably. <laughs> Definitely different times. Marketing and communications. So this can include journalism, communications, PR, traditional marketing. 74% of these respondents expected to make between thirty-one dollars and $40,000. STEM majors, which I think most of us are familiar with, computer sciences, engineering, mathematics, 96% of these respondents expected to make between 31 and 70. So a huge range for that role, that major, excuse me. And I think where that really comes in is you have people graduating with degrees in computer science and they're coming out of certain programs where they're getting jobs as developers. Then you've got math majors who are moving into a lot of the big data and, and statistics type positions but they're still not sure where their role is going to be and so they're, they're willing to take a lower salary and then you've got engineers whether they're going into construction management, civil engineering, um, what have you and they're starting out at a, at a higher salary so it's, it's not surprising to me that you have three levels there 
um, at equal proportion depending on those majors and, and where it can go. They can catch up, and I think that's a really important thing is that math majors has become what engineering was probably 20 years ago and how statistics and big data is using that. So I think it's a very interesting one. Absolutely, and data scientists probably fall into that role, that category, and that's a new hot role that's emerging. Totally. Uh, two more majors. So liberal arts, which is what I grew up in, English, history, art, and theater. So 50% expected to make between thirty-one and $40,000 a year. And our last major, natural sciences, agriculture, environmental sciences, and biology. Um, 100% of these respondents expected to make between thirty and $60,000. And I think it's very similar. So you get people that come out with a degree in biology, chemistry, um, environmental science, agriculture, and if they're going to go to work in, you know, you graduate with a degree in environment, environmental science and you go to work for a construction company, you go to work for uh, an environmental hazard company in a construction high growth area, you may be making more. If you graduate with a degree in chemistry and you're not sure what you want to do and you, you're willing to get any job, just as you figure out whether you're going to apply to med school or do those things, you're much more flexible and you're willing to take a job in the thirty to forty thousand dollar range. So I think very similar to the STEM, a lot of these folks, they're very specific degrees. They're not always sure exactly what they want to do, which lowers the salary expectations. But the ones who have the specific degree and know exactly what they want to do, it raises it because those people are in high demand. So I think that's really interesting data. You know, my takeaways for, for all of you folks on the webinar today is know the market. And I think you've got to compare your company to other companies on Glassdoor. You've got to read the salary guides. I think that's a really important thing to know. They're not um, written in stone. I think that all, it's too often, I mean, I, I, even whether it's my company or other companies, I look and I talk to leaders of, of very sales-driven organizations, and you'll get people that'll list their salaries on Glassdoor as purely base salaries, but their commissions may be 50% of their base on top of that, and they're like, well, I don't understand. Why are they doing that? Because even users don't understand the information they're filling out. So don't get frustrated by it. Take it with a grain of salt, but understand that your data may be skewed, somebody else's data may be skewed. However, if all of our data is skewed, then in some weird, bizarre world, it's all accurate, right? So how's that for you? So um, the other salary resources which are important is pay scale, simply hired. You can you, it, it, again, it's a benchmark to know where you stand and to know what other companies are doing and how it works. But let's review. Start recruiting grads earlier. You may think you've missed the boat now. You can do you can do a huge hiring blitz at your company. Right? There are still graduates that are hiring in May, and guess what? There's a lot of people that are finishing up in August. Okay, So you can do that, then you can focus on December grads. And as you can tell by this, it takes a lot of preparation, planning, putting pen to paper, and creating a communication plan in your own company. Your industry doesn't matter as much as your culture. There are certain things that sizzle. Your company, the hiring manager, career growth, and the brand in the industry, those are important. But if you don't have it, don't think that you're, de you're dead in the water. Graduates want growth and opportunity more than they want any perk. Feedback, respect, accountability, challenging. Graduates don't always get the salary they want, but it's important for you to know the market. Right? Explain to them, this is where you bring people in. We don't necessarily wait until a year to do reviews. We want to see what you're capable of. Create a situation where people can accomplish things and be rewarded and make more money. And graduates are willing to take on temporary roles. Right? which means they're flexible. Maybe they'll come in as an intern. Maybe you can find somebody on a temporary basis and try them out. Maybe you can find somebody to do part-time work. Flexibility is what the measurement is of that, that survey result on temporary labor. So I'll flip it back to Jessica, as I think we've got a few, uh, a few questions. We do. One listener wanted to know, did recent graduates see a connection between training and development and opportunities for growth? Yeah, it's something that's very common. I'm not sure that the correlation is always that specific for recent graduates, but what they see is a company is willing a company is willing to invest in me. They're willing to train me, and that must make me believe or I believe that that must make them believe that I have potential, right? So there's an indirect correlation there. Great. Another question is, we hire for very niche roles that require specific skills. How do I find graduates who have that experience? 
So what you're really looking for is internship basis. You're really looking for people with certain degrees. And so you've got to make sure, I, I'm not sure whether you have um, the licenses for the job boards. You can definitely do it that way to find out what schools have the best programs in those. And quite frankly, the best is all arbitrary, right? You may you may be a, have a company that could only attract the bottom quartile from the best school, but you may be able to get one of the best people from a second or third tier school in that space. So not everyone can get an engineer from Georgia Tech. Right? But you may be able to get an engineer from a, from a different school and to attract people that way. So know the schools, know what the degrees are that they specialize in, they have really good programs in, and get familiar with those career services departments and professors that teach them even more. Great. And playing off that, one listener wants to know how many universities they should be working with. Well, that really comes down to your bandwidth and how many things that you're working on. If you're a two-person human resources department and you don't have a separate uh, campus recruiter on staff and your managers aren't willing to travel and the budgets are limited, then you're probably looking at local colleges and universities within a, a 25 or 30 mile radius. If you have a bigger team and you can afford to be outside of there, then that works really well is to focus on 8, 10, 12 schools. If you're a 50-person company and you're looking to hire three or four kids, that's different than being a 1,000-person company that's going to have a start class of 30 or 40 people um, with recent college graduates. So you've got to break it down by what your bandwidth is. And you can post jobs at, at, at every college you want to from a career services standpoint, but you're not going to be able to build relationships with those career services departments and go to every single one. So you know, my belief is you start off small, two, three, four schools, you get, it, you get that under your belt, and you're probably farther ahead than you were last year at this time. Great. Another listener wants to know, once we have someone in a role, how long should we expect them to be in that role before they want to be promoted? Well, goodness, that's really a based on the individual and the, the depth of the role. There's certain roles that people don't really have a full grasp on for four, five, six years. And there's also, depending whether you're going to do horizontal movement for people or whether it's purely vertical and promoting them into a, into a bigger job title. And you don't want to get in the habit of giving people a bigger job title but having them do the exact same job because then they're wondering, what did I really get promoted to do? So it's working with your human resources department, it's working with the hiring managers and figuring out where they're at. Now the key to this is that we didn't touch on, it's, it's management development. So are your managers having regularly one-on-one -on -one meetings with their staff? And regular meaning no less than once a month and probably uh, you know, some places weekly but, but usually twice a month. Um, to have meetings with their staff and to know what they're working on, where their areas of development are, and it should be in a, in a process. A high growth company, people are maybe moving jobs or getting promoted every 24 to 36 months. In a more traditional state company, it might be every four to six years. Great. Thank you so much for your time today, Tom, and all of your insights. The webinar was recorded and we will send out the recording in just a couple of days. Thank you all for your time. Have a great afternoon.